Welcome to today's webcast, Medical Imaging and More. I'd like to turn today's event over to your presenter, Simon. Simon, you now have the floor. All right, thank you very much. Um, and good morning. Um, my name is Simon Mercer. Uh, I'm the Director of Health and Wellbeing here at Microsoft Research uh, in Redmond, just outside Seattle. So it's morning for me. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the different work that we've been doing in-house related to medical imaging. Uh, before I get to that, let me tell you a little bit about uh, myself and, uh, and what my role is inside Microsoft Research. I'm part of a group called the Outreach Team, and uh, the goal of myself and my colleagues is to demonstrate the value that Microsoft Research can bring uh, when it comes to uh, the application of computer science into different areas of academic research. Um, medical imaging is one of them, but it's not the only area that we work in. Uh, we're quite broad. Um, Microsoft Research itself consists of about 1,200 uh, people. Um, the vast majority of them are computer science researchers and they're based in labs around the world. Uh, we currently have around about 10 labs. Now, of course, as you might imagine, um, the focus of Microsoft Research is uh, computer science, the types of things that you might uh, that uh, would be applicable to uh, Microsoft products and uh, the research that occurs in Microsoft Research finds its way into products quite regularly. Uh, but the thing about researchers is that they're very interested in applying their theoretical computer science in different areas of research. Um, and so uh, that's really the, the genesis of our interest in medical because medical imaging um, uh, is one field in which it's possible to obtain uh, large quantities of complex data, complex image data, etc., which is very useful for us to, um, uh, to build uh, algorithms and to uh, attempt to analyze in different ways. Uh, the applications of doing so apply far beyond the field of medical imaging and uh, relate to computer vision and the analysis of images in general. Nonetheless, we do have researchers here who are specifically interested in medical imaging, and I'll be talking a little bit about their work and the other work that we've been doing uh, in support of them over the last 18 months or so. Um, so without further ado, I'll move on to uh, my second slide here, and I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the context of what we're doing and, and the reasons why medical imaging. Um, we believe that uh, in order to improve algorithms, uh, the larger the data sets that you can train them on, uh, the better your algorithm will be. In fact, this was demonstrated to us um, a couple of years ago uh, when we were developing the Kinect sensor, which you'll be familiar with uh, from Xbox and so forth. It can recognize where you're standing and what gestures you're performing, and you can use that to drive a game or some other type of uh, application. When we were developing it, um, we created a large set of body position images. Literally, we took people, we stood them in front of a camera, we made them strike different poses, um, and then we used the, that set of images uh, to train an algorithm that would recognize body positions more generally. And when we'd done that, we found actually we didn't have a very good algorithm. Um, if you just take a few tens of thousands of uh, images of people um, and train an algorithm on that, it turns out that's not really enough data to get a very good algorithm for body position recognition. And so we tried a different approach. We created an application uh, which would automatically generate large amounts of synthetic data about body position. And once we got truly millions of images, we could train our algorithm on that synthetic data and result in the algorithms that underlie Connect today. And what that told us is simple. The best data is more data. And the more data that you can train an algorithm uh, using, the better the resulting algorithm at whatever task it is that you trained it for. So broadly speaking, we use a little tagline here, which you'll see on the slide. Our goal is to free the data and accelerate the research. The more data you can get, the more easily you can get that data. The more data that then becomes annotated and useful for training algorithms, the better the algorithms, whether applied in medical imaging or elsewhere. So the question that we asked ourselves was what the best approach to this would be, and that we, we broke it into three phases. You'll see these indicated in the yellow uh, bar across the top. Uh, how do you get the data? Acquisition. Um, how you actually, having got the data, how you make it useful by annotating it, and that's the annotation phase, and then how you share the data with your colleagues and how you start um, to incentivize, incentivize people to build better algorithms uh, for medical research and other purposes. 
so I'll take those three uh, different areas and I'll, I'll tackle them one by one. The first one I'm going to talk about is acquisition. Now I don't have uh, terribly much to say about that, so I'll move on to uh, to the rest of the um, the presentation quite quickly from here. Uh, the problem with data acquisition is that it has to be um, it, well, we're dealing with, when we talk about medical images, quite naturally, we're dealing with patient data. And that data needs to be anonymized and it needs to be received from the hospitals, uh, which act as the collection points of that data. Having spoken to patients uh, who have tumors and, and, and other things from which medical images are being collected, as a general rule, they're extremely keen to participate in any type of research that would improve the experiences of patients in a, in a similar position to them. In short, the patient isn't the issue. Patients are very happy to share their data as a general rule. Hospitals quite naturally tend to be uh, more concerned with protecting the, uh, the personally identifiable information of patients, etc. And as many of the people on this call will know, um, the way that that, uh, that data can be um, uh, obtained from hospitals is by consulting through their uh, uh, an ethical review board. Um, and of course, the ethical review board may make the data available under certain circumstances, perhaps not publicly, but only to a certain set of individuals. And in general, it's always useful to have that data anonymized, if not actually um, a requirement of the ethical review board. Um, the problem with all of this is this means that extracting data from hospitals is a question of dealing with it on a hospital by hospital basis. It doesn't scale. You have to approach the hospitals, you have to approach the review boards, and depending on the nature of the data and the nature of the use to which you're putting the data, the hospital may apply different levels of uh, protection on that data. This approach doesn't scale. Now, we still need that data initially because we need to have sets of real medical imaging data in order to uh, determine what we need to do in, our, in order to train our algorithms. But perhaps there's a longer term future. And this is why I said I don't have terribly much to say on this slide because I don't have much to tell you right now about that longer term future. But just as with the Connect, the best way for us to approach that was to generate large amounts of synthetic data. You could imagine that if we were capable of gen generating synthetic medical images of sufficient fidelity that they could be used to train algorithms which could then be applied to real people's data, then we'd solve the data acquisition problem. If we could generate large quantities of synthetic data, then what we could easily do is if you had a rare case that you wanted to develop an algorithm to recognize automatically, you could generate a million of those rare cases quite easily when, of course, acquiring the same data would be hard or impossible from the general patient community. So we are moving in the direction of trying to generate synthetic data. The reason why I, I'll tell you about the direction, but I can't tell you about the results yet, is we've only just started moving in that direction uh, in collaboration uh, with the French INRIA Research Institute, uh, where we have some joint postdocs uh, located who um, will be working on this problem in the coming months and years. So. Basically, our, our approach to acquisition is solve it for a few hospitals in the, in the near term so we can gain data to train our algorithms. But in the longer term, we see the future as being uh, the creation of automatic large data sets where the ground truth data is automatically recognized, i.e. the labeling has been done uh, when the data was created. Now, that would be ideal. But I do mention labeling, so I'll move on to the next, uh, next piece, which is annotation. It's all very well to have a large amount of medical data available. And of course, when this comes directly from patients and has been anonymized, um, then what you really need to do is you need to then go in and label that data so that you know what it's showing you. Because currently, uh, the state of the art for, um, for the automated image recognition on a computer is not sufficiently good to automatically recognize um, that it's looking, say, at a CT scan and a kidney or, or whatever it might be on the screen. And so what's required for the annotation step is you need to um, get uh, some rather expensive, uh, highly trained radiologists, uh, put them in a room, show them your test data set, and ask them what it, what it says. And an experienced radiologist will then go in and annotate the data. Now, the problem with that is it's a slow process. It's extremely manual. And of course, you're taking radiologists away from um, uh, real clinical work and uh, quite possibly um, they, they will cost you a large amount of money to do that anyway. So uh, the annotation of large data sets is problematic. And that brings us on to a tool called GEOS. 
Now, as you'll see on the slide, I've got an indication of the web pages there and the user forums that you can you know, that you can go to if you'd like to download a copy of GEOS, play with it yourself, and ask questions on the user forums of other people in in that position. Um, Basically, uh, GEOS is a semi-automated image annotation tool that we developed in order to minimize the workload uh, on radiologists when they annotate uh, data sets uh, because we need that ground truth data to train our algorithms. Uh, we've run some user workshops for, for GEOS. You'll see a picture of one right there that we ran in Cambridge last year uh, because although we're developing it as part of Microsoft Research, uh, we're doing so uh, with the input of the medical uh, image analysis community. Uh, we had we brought in a range of radiologists. We asked them the sort of features that they that they would see as useful in this tool, and we've been expanding the tool in accordance with their requests over the last year or so. Um, it's available freely for download, uh, but please, uh, it is only available for research purposes. Uh, please don't use it for clinical or diagnostic purposes. It's not. Um, it wasn't built with that in mind. Um, and I, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a quick demo and I'm going to show you what GEOS can do. Uh, we believe we've built a tool which is quite intu intuitive to use and the radiologists who've used it to date have, uh, have uh, spoken about uh, it reducing their workload by uh, a very large amount, by an order of magnitude actually is what I was told. Um, so uh, let me just switch over to my monitor and then I can drive the application and show you it here. Okay, you should see a large gray screen with for research use only, not for use in diagnostic procedures written in the middle. This is the opening page of the GEOS application and I will now load a medical image and I'll show you how to annotate it. Here's one that I prepared earlier. And after a second it will load a CT volume. Uh, you should see on your screen um, the interface which is predominantly in black and gray and you'll see three different visualizations of the same CT volume. Uh, a large one in the in the center here uh, and two other views on the side. Uh, hopefully you should be able to see my mouse moving indicating those views. If you'd like to switch between one view or the other, you simply click and you can move, uh, swap between the three different views. And through by scrolling, you can actually scroll through the CT volume. I know it updates slowly um, on, this, uh, on this call. Uh, the scrolling is really rather smooth ordinarily, but uh, it, I can see your screens and it appears to be rather jumpy there. Now, if I'm interested in this and I'd like to, well, I suppose I should just walk you quickly through a few of the features in the interface. Uh, GEOS is called GEOS because it uses a geodesic image segmentation um, uh, algorithm uh, that, uh, to actually recognize features in medical images. If you'd like to tune that, then you can go to the settings over here. Opening that up, you see a range of different uh, parameters that you can set. Uh, for the algorithm there. I won't mess with them right now. What I can say is you can save different combinations of settings as presets and if I go down to the other corner here uh, you can see a range of different presets which are, have the, the window uh, display levels optimized for different tissues. I'm going to segment some soft tissue here so I'm going to select a, uh, the liver settings even though I'm actually going to segment a kidney for you. Uh, so that should that pretty radically changes the view as you can see there. Uh, you can get some further information about uh, the exact signal, uh, as you'll see in a histogram here, and some uh, other features which are adjustable just above it. But in general, this will do for me. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll uh, through here until I see a kidney come into view. I happen to know uh, that the circular feature here is a kidney. Uh, and I'm going to segment that. So here's how I'm going to do it. Well, first of all, I'm going to choose a segmentation label. And I will actually change the default name from segment label here uh, to kidney. Okay, uh, so now I've indicated that I will be segmenting a kidney here. I'll select this label, which I've already done. I can change its color, but I'm going to leave it dark blue in the hope that that displays well for you. Now what I need to do is I need to indicate which part of the, this, um, this image is the kidney that I want to segment. And also I'm going to indicate which parts are not the kidney that I want to segment. And by providing those two different sets of information to the algorithm, the algorithm can work out all of the different bits of the kidney. And that's, that's what I'm going to show you now. If you need to know how to drive this application yourself, or you need, you need to know the different um, um, uh, 
controls that you have, uh, you can simply hold down the F1 button and the display is replaced by a little crib sheet of the different key bindings that you can use. I'm just going to use a couple of these, so I'll, I'll take that away and I'll, uh, I will show you um, uh, how to indicate an area and how to indicate something that is not that area. So by taking this brush, I'll simply hold down the shift and the left mouse key and I will mark the kidney here. I'm just basically swiping inside the kidney area. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swipe outside the kidney area. I'm going to say that's not kidney there, no, that's not kidney there, still not kidney over here. Okay, done. That's all I needed to do. Now I'm going to hit the F5 button which activates the algorithm and you'll see uh, that what it's done is it's found all the bits of the kidney um, and it hasn't um, let this area that it's that's segmented here uh, bleed out into the area surrounding the kidney. But if I scroll up and down through the CT volume, you'll see although it's got it right, it starts to lose the plot of it as we as we move through the kidney. You see, at that point it hasn't quite got, got everything and it gets worse and worse and kind of peters out as we get lower down the segments. So what I do is simply repeat the process when I find a segment that didn't quite make it here. I just swipe in here again and I'll give it some more indicators of what no kidney looks like and I'll hit the F5 button again. And what it will do is it will do the segmentation on that slice and all the other slices that it can find, but again it starts losing the plot a bit of further down. Now what I can do actually is I don't have to scroll through and find the bits that it doesn't find. I can simply get it to suggest where it feels a little weak uh, on, on kidney segmentation. So I clicked on the suggest button at the top there. As you can see it didn't quite get cert certain areas here. So I'll just keep on whoops, segmenting like this um, and indicating areas that aren't kidney. I don't have to keep on doing all of this in every slice, uh, but this will help me work out the remainder of the kidney, nearly there. Uh, scroll through to a bit that it really didn't get down here and I'll indicate this and then I'll go a little bit further whoops, and I'll indicate that. Okay, That should be enough and I push the F5 button once more it works it out well nearly there uh, it looks like it's uh, it's decided that this isn't kidney so let me just fix that part thinks a little bit more uh, we're nearly there okay I'll go right up to the to the top end of the kidney here indicate a little bit more emphatically that that's kidney and this is not kidney and hit the F5 button for what I hope will be the last time. Yep, there we go. Okay, now as you can see I've segmented the kidney and I did so in a few strokes. Quite typically uh, there are applications out there where a radiologist has to click around the entire margins on every uh, CT scan slice to, uh, to do the same work. Um, now if you will see, okay I've managed to uh, segment all of the pieces there but if I switch to one of the other views, you can see that also it will show you the uh, segmentation uh, in all three different visualizations here. Uh, so you can see that I covered all of the area. Having done the segmentation, I can click on Segmentation Info over here, open up a panel which has a little report on it. Uh, ordinarily, well in some versions, you will see a three-dimensional representation here uh, showing the actual uh, volume rendering uh, of the segmented area. Uh, but if you're interested in simply a volumetrics measurement, you can see that that's, uh, that's present, present on the report here. And the histogram here shows signal intensity throughout the different uh, slices. You can add some notes, you can save and print this report uh, for your records. So that's a quick rundown through, through GEOS. Uh, as I say, the purpose of GEOS really is uh, to automate or to remove as much of the labor as possible from the image segmentation process. The reason why we care about this as part of our workflow here is that the larger amount of ground truth labeled data that we can generate, uh, the better job we can use of training medical image analysis algorithms. But nonetheless, this tool is... Uh, is, is uh, useful more broadly than simply Microsoft Research and so we've made it available uh, under the non-commercial license that I spoke about before and either you can do a web search for GEOS, uh, G -E -O -S, uh, or you can look at the, uh, the web links uh, on, the, on my slide deck or simply go to the medical imaging page at Microsoft Research and you'll find everything I'm talking about here is linked from those pages. Anyway, I'm going to go back to my slides now so if you'll indulge me for just one second
Okay, right, hopefully you can see my slides again, and I'm back on the GEOS slide. Um, and uh, I, yes, I think I said everything I need to say about that. Uh, moving on, okay, so let's imagine that you've, uh, you've gone on this journey with me and you've gone down these different steps of the medical imaging pipeline. Uh, we have somewhat solved the issue of obtaining data from hospitals, although we have to still approach them on a case-by-case -case basis. One day we hope to have synthetic data which will get around that issue and get around the issues of patient confidentiality. Now that we've got a larger volume of medical imaging data available, it's just raw data. It still isn't useful for training algorithms, and we need, therefore, uh, to actually have some means of annotating larger volumes of data than were available before. And I've shown you GEOS that enables that. Now, this, this slide, I'm talking about the third part uh, of the process and the cloud-based part and also the largest part of what I'm going to talk about. And that relates to a platform that we're building at the moment, and it's called CodaLab. CodaLab is intended, well, we include it here under the collaboration area, the third part of what I've been talking about in the medical imaging pipeline. But it's much more than just collaboration. I just had to use one word to describe this piece, but uh, I found it uh, not possible to encapsulate all of the different aspects of CodaLab in a single word. So collaboration is one piece, but there's more. What is CodaLab? CodaLab is a playground. CodaLab is intended to be a place where you can actually improve algorithms easily and interactively and in collaboration with other people in your community uh, who would like to see improved algorithms. Now, I attend a lot of medical imaging workshops and uh, one of the major ones that occurs each year is called MICAI, uh, M-I-C-C-A-I. Um, now, uh, MICAI is held in September each year and in conjunction with MICAI, there tend to be a lot of medical imaging competitions. A competition in this context is, is quite simple. If I'm a medical imaging researcher and I want to figure out whether I've got my algorithm uh, tuned and optimized in such a way that makes it perhaps the best in the field at you know, image segmentation or labeling or, or, or registration or any one of these areas that medical imaging people care about, uh, then what I might want to do is I might, might want to take a common data set. I might want to put it in a common place. And I might, might then want to invite all of the other uh, groups out there, all of the other medical imaging researchers working on, an, uh, on problems similar to my own. I might want to invite them to try their algorithm against the same data set that I, that I put up there so that we can actually produce a benchmark, a common set of results showing the relative strength of performance of our different algorithms on this particular task. In other words, a competition. Now, CodaLab supports competitions. It also, incidentally, supports many more things, um, and most of them I'm not going to go into today. You're welcome to browse around the running instance of CodaLab, uh, which you'll see is deployed at www.codalab.org. Um, and you're also welcome to participate in the open source project that's associated with CodaLab. Uh, well, I'll tell you briefly a little bit about what those other areas do, but I won't be demoing them. Um, this is all about worksheets and experiments. Let's imagine a world in which we are running a lot of uh, competitions on the CodaLab platform. And as I'll show you in a minute, we are running a lot of competitions or some competitions now. We've got more in the pipeline. And I'd like to invite all of you on the call today to explore it. And if you have a, a use for this, please uh, come to CodaLab.org and try it for yourself and try to set up a competition. I'll show you how in a minute. Um, but once you actually have these competitions running and you have a lot of algorithms that people are contributing and validating essentially through the competition and saying my algorithm performs this well in this particular uh, challenge, uh, then we essentially aren't just growing a pool of shared data sets and a pool of competitions. We're also growing a pool of user contributed algorithms. Now, there are plenty of other examples in the community, far more broadly than just medical imaging, actually, um, about how people have run competitions. Uh, one that was quite famous, uh, that was held a little while ago, was actually run by um, uh, the streaming video company Netflix. Now, Netflix have a recommender system, so if you, um, if you come along and... Um, uh, and you're a user of Netflix and you're interested in, say, um, you know, horror movies, 
uh, then Netflix, after seeing a few of your selections in the horror movie genre, will start suggesting to you other horror movies that you might like to watch. And so, you know, and of course, uh, there are many other things. If you're a, a customer on Amazon.com, you'll see, you know, people who liked the things that you're looking at also liked these other things. Now, of course, all of this is driven under the, under the surface by recommender algorithms. And there is, of course, a tremendous requirement to improve these recommender algorithms to provide uh, users of the, uh, services like Amazon and Netflix with better experience. So Netflix went out there and they set up this thing called the Netflix Recommender Challenge. And they offered a very substantial amount of money, I believe it was a million dollars, uh, to anyone who could improve the existing Netflix recommendation algorithm by 10%. Now, it turns out that it's re re relatively easy uh, to come up with a solution that's a few percent better than, uh, than the Netflix algorithm that they're using currently. But, of course, a few percent doesn't cut it. You need to get over 10 percent or you don't win the prize. And many people tried, and fundamentally everybody failed to win the Netflix recommended challenge using their different approaches. Turns out you can get about 8 percent, but after that people start coming up empty. It's just difficult to improve beyond about 8 percent. But nonetheless, somebody did win the, the rec Netflix Recommended Challenge, and the way they won it was that the two front-running algorithms in combination produced more than 10% of an improvement. In isolation, neither did, but in combination, they managed to achieve the goal. And what that tells me is that if you're running a competition and you have the front-running algorithm, in fact, the best approach may not be your algorithm at all. It might be your algorithm in combination with some of the other front-runners. And in fact, uh, that is borne out in medical imaging challenges as it was with the Netflix Recommended Challenge. Now, that's a very long-winded way of me telling you what the other piece, aside from recommended, uh, aside from challenges, is in CodaLab. It's a process of taking algorithms and stringing them together and creating your own workflows, or taking a data set of your own that wasn't actually used in any of the challenges and subject to the licensing constraints on the individual algorithms that you'll find in, in CodaLab, actually taking those algorithms and producing pipelines so that you can analyze your data sets with these algorithms, not just the data sets that they were used for in the competition. And of course, with each algorithm that you're using, you'll be able to tell exactly how good it is because it's been benchmarked against its peers in a standard competition, which you'll be able to see and browse the results of. So that's kind of the end-to-end -end vision for CodaLab, if you like, but we're not there yet. We have all the medical imaging stuff for competitions set up, and I'll be showing you that in a second, but we don't yet have a fully working piece uh, that does the experimentation side. You're welcome to go to the tool and browse and see how far we've got, but it's not in final form. It's not even close to it yet, but you'll see it develop. You might well ask yourself, um, you know, isn't this a bit peculiar? I mean, Microsoft does Office and Word and SharePoint and PowerPoint and all of the other things that we do. Um, but, you know, we, we're not, we never invite people to come and see early prototypes and see how they work. Uh, well, in this particular case, you have to bear in mind that I work for Microsoft Research. I'm not in the product side. And Microsoft Research is essentially a much more open organization, and we do a lot of our development in the open. In this particular case, as you'll have seen from the slide, this is not a project that is solely Microsoft's responsibility. Microsoft, in fact, doesn't quote-unquote own the project ourselves. Uh, what we did was we developed it using an open source foundation similar to the Apache Foundation called Outer Curve. And we transferred ownership to Outer Curve, and we made Outer Curve, uh, well, we didn't make Outer Curve, but Outer Curve agreed to release um, uh, CodaLab as Apache 2 licensed open source. In short, you can go to GitHub, you can look at the CodaLab project on GitHub, and you can see every line of code that we've written. You can see our approaches, and because it's written in Python, if you're an academic, you may well be more familiar with that than many of the uh, more Microsoft standard languages. And that's good for us because we'd like you to invite, uh, we'd like to invite you not only uh, to use CodaLab, uh, but to contribute to it as an open source project. As with any other competition platform, it's not perfectly suited to any competition or any use you might have for it. Hopefully you will be able to use the standard set of features, uh, but we're actually providing you with the opportunity to build on the features that you want and then have those incorporated into the core code and made available to everyone else who wants to use CodaLab for their work. So over time, this will become a snowball. More features will be added over time. It'll become applicable to more competitions and it'll be less work for people to run a competition of their own uh, because others who've gone before them have contributed extra features. Okay. So that's basically it, and what I'm going to do is, and now I'm going to just um, take over the screen again, 
um, and walk you through uh, what Coda Lab does. So one second. Okay, you should be seeing my monitor. Very nice Pacific Northwest scene to, on Bing today. And I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to open up a web browser. I'm going to show you a few different pages. Now, actually, before I move on to Coda Lab, I, I forgot to mention this when I got to it, so I'll mention it now. Uh, there is, of course, a user guide included with Geos. Uh, if you uh, download uh, the Geos uh, installer, it will install a user guide on your machine as well. Double clicking on the user guide opens it in a web page, and you can actually be walked through each of the steps of running Geos. Uh, if you're interested in doing so, uh, you'll also find a number of videos on the web, how-to guides, and so forth. Uh, just search for Geos and you'll get that. Okay, so back to CodeLab. Here I am at www.codalab.org. This is a public site, so you can be welcome to go there, sign up, and play around, um, even establish your own competitions if you wish to do so. Um, now, uh, as you can see, it's divided into two pieces. We've got worksheets and competitions. The worksheets refers to all the experimentation stuff I mentioned earlier, the things that were not really fully developed yet, but you're welcome to, uh, to collaborate with us on its development. Uh, I won't bother going into that piece. What I'll do instead is I'll go into the competitions piece, which you can access either by clicking on the competitions label that you see I'm, I'm pointing at now, or going up to the menu bar at the top and looking at competitions there. I'll click on this label. And what it does is it takes me to a list of running competitions. As I say, CodeLab is already underway. It's already a project that's, been, that's in use by a number of groups, not just medical imaging people, by the way. Uh, and you can browse a set of competitions uh, for medical imaging and other things here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at BRATS 2012. Uh, this is the Multimodal Brain Tumor Segmentation Challenge that's been run, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, uh, for at least the last three years, and they'll be running it again in 2014 uh, very shortly, and you'll be able to come back here and see it um, once we've got it set up, which probably will be by July. So I'll click on the Multimodal uh, uh, Brain Tumor Segmentation Challenge from 2012, and I'll just walk you through the different pieces of the competition here. I'm not signed in right now, so I can't uh, get into this competition, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a minute, but I can show you what the public can see. Okay, so it takes me first to this page where I'm invited to learn the details of the competition. Um, I will indicate a couple of features to you here. You'll see this gray bar across the top showing the different phases of the competition. A competition can have any number of phases. In this particular case, there was an early training phase in which uh, data from a previous year's competition was, was released uh, to the participants just really so they could get used to training algorithms on a set of data. The second phase, which began in August, on August the 1st in 2012, uh, released a new set of, uh, of data. Uh, which what they did is they released both the actual medical images and the ground truth segmentations of that data. Uh, so people could train their algorithm and actually check its accuracy versus the ground truth which they could see. Then when the challenge ran, which is the third phase here, um, then a second set of data was released, and that set uh, were the medical images themselves, anonymized, of course, but the ground truth data was concealed. And then, of course, people ran their algorithms against, that, uh, against those medical images and attempted to predict uh, the location of different features. And then after that, um, the, uh, there was an automated evaluation process which occurred, which figured out how close each one of the participants was uh, to the ground truth information um, and ranked them. And of course, that, those were the results of the challenge. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is just the, the, different, um, the different phases of the challenge. And if you ran a challenge yourself, you could customize and have any number of phases in any order and with any duration that you, you chose to do, including open-ended phases. A phase doesn't have to end. Okay, but I'm just learning the details at the moment, so I want to figure out if I want to participate in this particular challenge. So by going to the Learn the Details tab, I see three different sections down here, Overview, Evaluation, and Terms and Conditions. Again, this is customizable. If you run a competition of your own, you can add additional phases and a different, additional pages if you like. But this is just to enable me to figure out if I want to compete. So I can read this boilerplate here, and I can figure out whether it's what I'm interested in. Okay, now the next thing I might want to know is, okay, this is my area. Let's see if I can, uh, if I'm interested in the evaluation criteria. Now, uh, what this does is this goes into some technical depth about the different types of computationally uh, mediated evaluation that your results will be subjected to. Uh, 
And there are a set of standard measurements, and you'll see some of them listed here, sensitivity, specificity, Hausdorff, Dice, Jacquard, etc. Uh, don't worry if those particular terms don't mean anything to you. Uh, they are technical terms uh, of specific metrics that determine the accuracy of someone's prediction uh, versus the ground truth. And so this is just really announcing that those are the different criteria that will be used to judge your entry should you choose to participate. Now, if you are going to choose to participate, you'll need to know the terms and conditions under which the data is released. And this, this is listed here, and you, you see different types of requirements that have been set by the competition owner saying, uh, you know, the data I have here, and this is often the case with medical data, has been released under certain conditions. And you must agree to those conditions before you're allowed to see the data. And that's, that's essentially uh, entirely definable by the owner of the competition. Okay, let's say I've read these terms and conditions, and now I'm comfortable. I want to participate. This is my area. I'm interested in the ways in which this uh, challenge will be, be evaluated, and I am compliant with the terms and conditions. So I'll go to participate to get started. Ah, I need to be logged in. Okay, fine. Well, let's log in, um, and that, what I'll do actually is I'll go to the main page here, um, and I'll just show you how. You can sign up, obviously, here, but if you already have a login, as I do, I'll sign in using the the menu bar here. Now um, I'll just quickly enter my username and password and I will sign in. Okay, it takes a second to sign me in. Okay, so this is what you see when you sign in. You're taken to a space on CodaLab called My CodaLab. Now My CodaLab at the moment only really deals with competitions and what it does is because you can be a participant in certain competitions or you can be an owner of a competition and actually set it up, configure it and run it yourself, uh, what we've done is we've created this little space so you can see the competitions you chose to join and the competitions that you're running without having to go through the whole uh, big public list. Now I'm not running any competitions right now, I could create one and I'll show you how in a minute. Uh, but I'm in these two competitions. Oh, look, I'm already in the Mikai Challenge. So uh, I can click on here and I, I can go to that Mikai Challenge and I can see a lot more about that challenge. Now, if I go to the Participate tab, I've been accepted for participation. So I can either go, go to the data, which in this particular case lives in the Virtual Skeleton database in Switzerland. Uh, clicking on that link would take me to the VSD and enable me to access that data. Incidentally, you don't have to go to an external data source. You can store the data locally on Azure, either in your own account and link, to, link it to CodaLab, and that's useful if you have large amounts of data or it's only been released to you, or you, you're concerned about adding extra layers of security, that all of those are possibilities. Also, if you have truly huge amounts of data, of course, data storage costs on Azure, and so those costs would be uh, billable separately from the main CodaLab instance, and uh, typically they would be picked up by the competition organizer. Okay, so I can get the data in this location. In, in this particular case, it just links out to somewhere else. Um, and, I, and once I've analyzed that data, I can submit my results. So I'll go here. Okay, now actually, I've been, I've been participating in this challenge uh, for a little while now. So I've actually submitted several sets of results. Rather dull, uh, I'm afraid, because I've called them all test submission. Uh, but nonetheless, you can say, say, see that I've made three different submissions to this, um, uh, to this challenge. I've made three different attempts, uh, essentially, to win the challenge. Let me take a look at one of these. Okay, so I can click on the little plus sign here. Now, I should say just before I get into this, if I had a fifth set that I wanted to submit, I'd simply click the button here. It would pop up an upload uh, dialog, and I could upload my results to the cloud and have them automatically evaluated. I'm not going to do that now because the evaluation script takes a couple of minutes to run, um, and I'd rather just uh, just keep showing you rather than watch... Uh, uh, watch a, an application run for a while. So what I'll do is I'll show you the results of that run. Um, uh, I'll click on a plus here. Uh, I didn't click, my mistake. Okay, there I go. Okay, having uh, clicked on the, the plus sign next to that particular line, you'll see I've opened it up and it shows me a range of different things about that submission. Okay, so I'm, I can download the submission so I can have it back, so I can see the results that I uploaded earlier. Uh, if I wanted to do that. Now, I uploaded this one, actually, um, I did uh, in January. So uh, I could actually retrieve my results from Azure now uh, and take another look at them if I don't have them around. 
I can also look at the standard output. In other words, I can see what happened when I ran my results. And I, it actually records a little real-time log here uh, of the results and how they were processed. It's not very interesting. Really, the, the point of this is it helps troubleshoot if anything went wrong on the cloud while you were running it. It unbundles the, uh, the data that you provided. It compares it with the, uh, with the ground truth data. It invokes a custom program for evaluation, which I'll, I'll talk about later. And then it generates the results and spits them out in a comma-separated uh, format in this particular case. In, in other cases, it, it spits them out in different ways. But uh, that just happens to be what this challenge needed. OK, so let me just go back here uh, to, to CodeLab. OK, now let's say that I'm interested. OK, so I know that my uh, my submission ran. Now I want to see the results of my submission. Well, I can take a look at just about everything that was uh, that, that happened on the cloud with my results. And I've just popped up a window here uh, where uh, I can look at the, uh, at the fine detail, if you like. Now I'll go in here and I'll look at the scores that I generated on the patient data set. And if I double click on it here, it'll start up Excel because it's a CSV format file. Uh, but of course, being CSV, it's also available in many other formats. And this is the, uh, the details of my competition entry. I won't go into all of these because obviously they're rather complex. Really, I'm showing you this to, to say that we're not concealing anything under the hood. You can take a look at the code that generated these results. You can take a look at these results themselves, which are the raw data uh, as a result of running that, uh, running that evaluation algorithm. And you can also see the summarized data, which is your competition entry. That is how well you, you actually did. Because this competition actually has a summarization process and reduces this much larger data set into your, only your competition results. And I'll show you those right now. OK, but you can get behind the scenes and see absolutely everything that you might be interested in about how your competition was run. OK, so I'll show you what happened to these results. I could submit them to the leaderboard here, in which case a check mark would, uh, would appear uh, in this column here. Now, as you can see, I already submitted the fourth set here. A check mark appears here. So let's just look at those. So I can click on the comp Well, actually, I go to the results tab here, I should say. Uh, and what that will do is it shows those results in context. As you can see, these were the real participants in the um, in the BRATS 2012 challenge. And as you can see, they did really rather well in all of the different metrics that we that we scored here. And then down here, poor old SJ Mercer, me, I was the worst of the bunch with my predictions. But as you can see, that for the different areas of the tumor, the complete tumor, the core area, the, the enhancing region, the dice scores are, are presented here and ranked for the individual participants. I can click on different columns and sort in different orders, or I can download as a CSV again, which opens up in Excel if you wanted to. You can download all of this data and play with it yourself. So we're trying not to be restrictive. Just because you're using this platform doesn't mean you get tied to this platform. OK? And that's really how you go about a competition, at least how you, how you go about participating in a competition. But there are a couple of other, other things I should mention in terms of how you set up a competition. If you go to My Coder Lab, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to Competitions I'm Running, and you can create a competition yourself. If you do so, it'll put you into an HTML-based competition editor and walk you through the different process uh, the different processes required to define the phases of your competition, uh, to define, divide the, uh, to do, I'm sorry, to, um, uh, to determine the leaderboard uh, for each phase of the competition, which are optional, but you, you can have leaderboards to tell how you're doing at each individual phase, and to define the terms and conditions, etc. But if you don't want to go through the HTML editor, we've made it easy for you. There's other ways of doing it, so I'll just minimize CodeLab there for a second, and I'll show you something else here. Uh, this, um, and uh, let me see if I can find the other piece of what I wanted to show you. Uh, I seem to have closed it down. I can't find it quickly, so I won't waste time on that. Um, 
essentially what I'm saying here is that you can you can either use the HTML editor to define your competition, which is fine, uh, or if you'd rather not uh, go through that and you know more about how to use this system, you can use this format instead. This is YAML, which stands for Yet Another Markup Language. It's not a, a, um, a creation of Microsoft. It's quite common in the academic community. It's essentially a dialect of XML, uh, which enables you to specify, uh, in this particular case, a set of commands which will define your competition fully. Now, this YAML file, as you can see, this actually relates to a machine learning challenge that, uh, that's being set up for uh, use at MICI, the medical imaging competition um, or the medical imaging meeting that I mentioned earlier. And in this particular case, it's a machine learning challenge. And what it does is it defines a single phase, and it defines all of the different columns that, uh, that should go onto the leaderboard, the order that they should take, whether any of them should be grouped together, etc. In short, this one simple file enables you to set up an entire competition. But there are certain exceptions to that rather simple rule. Um, you still have to define exactly how your competition is evaluated. If you're using standard medical imaging um, uh, terminology, you're attempting to do segmentation, which is a very standard medical imaging uh, activity, uh, which you'll find the vast majority of competitions run at Mackay have some segmentation element associated with them, uh, then you can also go to our site and download uh, an evaluation script uh, which, uh, for which we're very grateful um, uh, to, um, to our collaborators in uh, the Technical U University of Vienna, uh, Alan Hanbury uh, and his student Aziz in particular. Um, and they created a, a large and complex medical image ev evaluation script, which um, means that all of the standard metrics are already encoded. All you have to do is use their script. If, however, you have a, a range of requirements for evaluation which are unique to your uh, competition then inevitably uh, as the competition owner you'll have to write that script we can help you to do so and there's ample documentation on the site once you've written that script you simply hook it in uh, under uh, the the line scoring program in this YAML file you upload the YAML and you upload the scoring program and the data and so forth and it will automatically make a competition for you looking just like the competition we walked through a few moments ago uh, and, of course, we do have user support people here who will help you do it if you get stuck. Now, going back uh, now to the website, um, here we are. So that would happen if you wanted to do an upload or use the HTML editor to create a competition. Um, and that's pretty much it for, uh, for the general part of CoderLab. I've shown you all the way through competitions, and I've shown you, actually, if you go to the site, you'll see there's a range of medical competitions already in progress, and uh, there's a pipeline of others that will be coming online. So watch this space for further ones in the future. The last part I want to talk about here with relation to CoderLab is how you might contribute features. So if you're a programmer out there, if you're thinking of running a competition yourself, but what you've seen would almost do but not quite fit what, what, what you need to do, and you'd have to add some, some features to make it usable, uh, you could do that. If you go down at the bottom here, you'll see GitHub uh, is labeled here. GitHub is an open source repository for those who don't know it. If I click on that, it takes us to our GitHub page. I'll just maximize this so you can see it more clearly. This is our page on the GitHub site. And I can go to our project by viewing the project on GitHub up here. And now you can see more details about CodeLab, how you get started. We've got CodeLab wiki here, so you can look at your frequently asked questions or answers to your frequently asked questions. You can also see how you get started, the fact that we support Unix-based competitions, actually Linux-based competitions, as well as uh, uh, for Windows and the Mac. So if you're not a, um, a strong Windows user and you're, or you find your user base uh, prefers Linux, that's not a problem. This supports Linux competitions alongside uh, Windows-based ones. And there's tons and tons of information here about uh, a lot of features that I haven't had time to talk about today uh, relating, for example, to uh, to the way you might want to parallelize your workflow when you're on the cloud uh, to get evaluation done more quickly. Uh, but there's a range of different things, and you'll find them in here. If you're interested, there's much, much more documentation. I've only scratched the surface here. Okay, now I'm going to uh, go back now to my slide deck, so uh, just one second while I do that. Uh... Okay, so you should see my Codalab slide back again, uh, so I'll just skip on from that. 
Um, I spent a long time talking about how competitions are run, so I won't run through this, except to say that we're implementing a series of shared access signatures for those of you who are fam familiar with Azure uh, to secure the data. Uh, at the moment, because you can link out to other, other data sources, you can still use this with secure data. You just need to protect it at the source end. But when you upload data to our system, we'll have a shared access scheme uh, which will enable you to uh, restrict data only to those who should see it in a very secure way. And in the future, we'll be introducing a federated access system to extend that security model far beyond CodaLab to secure data in third-party accounts and beyond. Um, so I won't go into this in details. There's more details on the web uh, if you're interested in the technical side to it. I also won't talk about exactly how a participant participates because I've shown you that. Um, so I'll just move on to this, my final slide. Uh, this has been a presentation as part of the Microsoft Azure for Research program, uh, which hopes to show you the benefits of using the cloud uh, for academic research. Um, Thank you very much for your time. If there are any questions, please feel free uh, to IM, um, uh, IM them over. Uh, or failing that, of course, you can also follow up in email. Um, I'll just move on one more slide to show you uh, this. Uh, if you do want further information on the medical imaging work, go to research.microsoft.com slash medimaging. And with that link, you'll go to you'll be taken to a page which will show you far more than just what I've shown you today, but will enable you to find download links for GIOS, references to CodeLab, etc. So thank you very much for your time. I'll turn you back to the moderator now. Okay, Simon, I did have just a few questions. If you just want to look at those in the IM real quickly. Ah, okay. I hadn't seen those come up. My mistake. Okay. No, I just popped them in there. Okay. Um, Okay, so two questions here. Uh, the first one is, does CodeLab support other clouds with regard to application runs and data storage? Uh, no, it doesn't. It's an Azure-only uh, Azure solution. Uh, we do make it possible uh, for people to contribute uh, to the development of CodeLab by using Python, etc. Uh, but currently, it's all hardwired into Azure uh, um, uh, under the hood. There will be nothing in principle to stop someone adapting the code uh, to use, for example, Amazon. Um, but it, it, to, to the extent that uh, CodeLab uses uh, the features of Azure in particular, um, you'd have to find the equivalents on Amazon, although I'm sure they do exist. Uh, the second uh, point is um, how it, are application runs underneath CodeLab build? Uh, that is a good question. And uh, at the moment, uh, although I do have a good answer for you, it's not a complete answer. As I say, CodeLab is a work in progress. Um, at the moment, uh, essentially, um, the way CodeLab works is there is a default Azure account, uh, which is the default location for, for upload uh, of everything that goes into CodeLab. Uh, that account is owned by whoever owns the CodeLab instance. Now, because it's an open source project, there's nothing to stop you from downloading and installing your own CodeLab instance. In fact, we'll help you do it. That's not our first choice, to be quite frank, because the whole point of CodeLab is community. If you're putting stuff up there to share it with your colleagues, surely it's better to go to an instance that's already running in a common location so that all of your colleagues and their colleagues are using the same instance and can co collaborate with you. But anyway, sometimes you might want to run your own, and so we do make that possible. Uh, so at the moment, the costs of the runs are devolved to the owner of the CodeLab instance. The owner of the CodeLab instance right now is Microsoft uh, and will shortly become uh, Professor Percy Liang, uh, who is a machine learning researcher at Stanford University. Um, and um, over time, he will uh, assume responsibility for, uh, for these matters and, uh, and will become one of the faces of the community that we're building. Uh, we have other uh, academics who we're also collaborating with uh, who may also choose to run their own CodeLab instances in the longer run. Now, that's the case at the moment. So everything gets billed directly to the application owner, uh, or rather, I should say, the instance owner. Um, what we will be doing in the future is we'll be adding a billing system in there, which will enable, at the behest, uh, or at the direction of the uh, instance owner, they will enable the costs to be devolved to the competition owner. So that will mean, essentially, if you have um, a, a need to run a competition, um, and if you want to, uh, if you have the resources to do so, you may also have to cover the billing to run that competition. Now, that the the extent of that billing will entirely depend on the size of the competition that you run. 
Uh, now, what will be happening with uh, with most competitions is, by default, they will just be uploaded into the default account, and costs will be covered by the Coda Lab owner. Uh, but the the reality is, if you've got truly huge competitions with truly large data storage and um, and uh, and software running needs, then the competition, the instance owner, may well ask you to uh, to take uh, responsibility for the billing piece uh, that you incur. Okay, I hope that's uh, that's covered that. All right, thank you, Simon. So, uh, everyone, we hope that you have found today's information helpful. If you enjoyed today's webcast or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, please let us know by completing our survey. You should see the link in a pop-up box on your screen at this time. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Simon Mercer. This concludes today's webcast. You may now disconnect from this call.